Hello. Um, it is a pleasure to be here virtually. I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to be here with you today. I'm going to be discussing um, experiments that we've done regarding metabolic complementarity in coral volubions across multiple taxa uh, in the context of coral bleaching. The first um, study that we did to address metabolic complementarity was a, an exclusively in silico analysis of genomic, metagenomic, and metatranscriptomic data available for corals. This is the work of Bishoy Kamel, a former student in my lab, and his article should be coming out later on this year. What Bishoy uncovered is that there is a, an intricate relationship between holobiome members. That's no surprise regarding Symbiotinaceae, the photosymbiont species, but it was more so for the microbial community. And um, we wanted to set out and test these experimentally. And we wanted to do it in, in a physiologically relevant context. And that's why we decided to pursue experiments in the context of thermally induced bleaching. So here you see a, um, a figure that depicts what happens in bleaching in, at the physiological level. So on the y-axis, you have um, photosynthesis and uh, absorption per cell. So you're looking at the photosymbiont physiological activity. And then on the x-axis, in the bottom x-axis, you see the amount of pigment per algal cell. This is a trait that is quite plastic and is controlled by the alga. And then in the top of the x-axis, you see algal cell density inside the host tissue, which is controlled by the animal. And there is a, an intricate crosstalk that takes place. And you see there is a lot of phenotypic plasticity. And this is because they have to adjust to different seasons and also different depths when, when, when they're out in the field. However, when you expose the organism, the holobion, to uh, an extreme temperature shock, there is a breakdown of the symbiosis, which ultimately results in coral bleaching. I've done a series of experiments related to this in collaboration with Roberto Iglesias, who's now at Penn State and previously was at UNAM in Mexico, and Hiroaki Kitano from the Systems Biology Institute in Japan. We wanted to test if the, the, the genomic basis of bleaching are similar across taxa, because we see in the literature people doing bleaching experiments um, most often based on a single species. And I think we need a better understanding of how conserved these responses are across taxa. We did this experiment in Puerto Morelos, Mexico, with three Caribbean species that uh, were chosen because of phylogenetic divergence, also because of physiological uh, response to thermal stress, and also because of the type of symbionts that they harbor. So what you see here depicted in different colors is something I'm going to continue to use throughout the rest of the talk. Uh, in the case of Pseudodiploria clivosa, we know that this is a thermally sensitive species. Its photosymbiont is Brevolium favinorum or clay B1 in, in the ITS um, gene. Um, then we have Orbicella favelata, which tends to show an intermediate bleaching phenotype, so is less sensitive to thermal stress than Pseudodiploria clivosa. And it has a, a, the colony that we use, the colonies that we use, had symbionts of, of Symbiodinium type A3. Then we have Cideracea radiance, uh, whose photosymbiont is also in the genus Brevolium, but the genotype is uh, in the B1. Um, and this is a very thermally tolerant species. This is experimental setup. We had an ambient uh, treatment at 26 degrees and uh, thermal stress treatment at 34 degrees, and we had three fragments of each species per treatment. The experiment lasted uh, nine days, and uh, 
Miki de Salvo was the student that did the, exper the experiments in the field, and Viridiana Avila was the student that, that did all the computational analysis and developed new statistics um, for this study. So what we see here is the photobiology data. So again, remember red is thermally sensitive and blue is thermally tolerant. And what you see in each one of these panels is that the top line is a control tank and the bottom line is the experimental tank. So you can see that Pseudorifloria clivosa tends to bleach after the nine days and Fabulata shows an intermediate phenotype and then Cedrasia radiance is, is more thermally tolerant. So when we look at the transcriptome data, and this is only um, from the photosymbiont side of things. So if you look at the differentially expressed genes, what you see is that in general, Brevolume B1 has an increased transcriptome response relative to Brevolume B5, the more thermally uh, resistant species. And there is a larger number of genes differentially expressed, and most of them are upregulated in Brevolume B1. And Simbarinium A3 shows the intermediate, the transcriptome phenotype that is linked to the intermediate physiological phenotype. Then to analyze this data in a, in a quantitative fashion, we teamed up with Rory Rhodes, who's a statistician at San Francisco State University who developed the phylogenetic ANOVA, or EVE, which is a method uh, that allows you to identify potentially um, lineage-specific adaptation at the gene expression level. So what you see here is a uh, hypothetical phylogeny of three species. Of course, you can have a much larger uh, tree if you have more expression data for multiple species. And the circles represent gene expression, purple being down regulation, dark green being up regulation, and the little gray boxes represent individuals containing those genes. Then you look at variation within population and um, between species. And by comparing these and using a phylogenetic tree, you can identify whether something is conserved or whether it's lineage specific at the gene expression level. What uh, the original Eve did was examine this data in the context of basal gene expression. So there was no particular treatment condition taken into account in the empirical data sets that Rory examined. And I think that's why she was interested in working with us because not only did we have basal gene expression, we had a particular condition, treatment condition like thermal stress that was added to the comparative analysis. So we really, really developed two additional statistics that uh, were that used if as a foundation. One of them she called if R, or the ground state approach, where you identify genes through the if model, but you don't know if they're involved in thermal stress in particular. You just know whether they are lineage specific adaptations or not. And then you filter those from their original. A identify group to determine if they are changing in response to thermal stress. So it's the if model initially, and then the response after the treatment. And that's, um, here is an example of that. So at the bottom you have the phylogeny and you have the basal gene expression. You see that is different in each one of the species. Uh, but then when you look at treatment, only the middle species seems to have a major change in gene expression post-treatment. So you can, with confidence, say there is a, 
changes in gene expression associated with this particular treatment. And then you can uh, also link that to the phylogeny. With this method, we were able to identify 24 genes in the host and 18 genes in the symbion that seem to be involved in thermal stress response. Another statistic that Vini developed is called the EFR ESD. And this is uh, linked to the, to, it, this is what we call the intrinsic state uh, approach. And what it, the way it works is slightly different because we're looking at the difference in expression between the control and the treatment. So basically we use the EFR response to stimulus by identifying which of those have a major difference between control and treatment. Um, and with this method, we were able to identify 63 genes in corals and 76 genes in the photosymbionts. Uh, I am unable during the duration of this talk to talk about every single one of them, but I'm going to give you examples for host of symbion using um, both methods. So here we're going to start with EVAR for host. And this is a gene that has uh, been reported by others experimentally proven that it's important in symbiosis. And this is an ATPase pump. So what this pump does is what you see here is it's a cartoon representation of a host cell with its symbi symbiosome, uh, which is the vacuole that contains the algal photosymbiont. So the pH requirements are very low. So the host needs to maintain the symbiosome at a pH approximately of four for the pump to function effective, oh, or sorry, for, for symbiosis to function effectively. So the, the, this leads to the translocation of photosynthate, which is represented by the arrow leaving the chloroplast into the host cell. And uh, as they communicate, then this, the, the, the photosynthesis continues to be given to the host. However, we know from the physiological experiment, physiological data that photosynthesis is not working already in Pseudorichloria uh, clivosa, which is the one here on the left. So you see that there is already a high basal gene expression to to make sure that the pump is working effectively. But then there is an increase in gene expression here, despite the fact that um, the photosymbiont is not functioning properly. So this is something that we attribute to the decoupling of symbiosis. The host is trying to keep the symbiont happy, but that's no longer effective. If we look at the symbiont side of things using EVAR, here is an example of two genes that are lineage specific to the brevolium branch of the tree, and that's depicted by the arrows pointing to the base of that part of the tree. And uh, you have similar responses in gene expression. Both genes are already uh, regulated in a control condition. And here we have an example, last example, of this gene that is involved in photosystem repair, UROD, that is showing lineage-specific adaptation exclusively to the Brevolium B5 lineage. So you have a major increase in transcripts per million of this gene after heat stress, and that is in the thermally a resistant species, so the photosystem is being repaired, and that's why there is no bleaching. Now, using the EVRESD method, here are uh, examples from the host. So these are all the categories where we found uh, 
the genes to be in, but I'm going to give you only examples from the apoptotic pathway because programmed cell death is really important in coral bleaching. So I figured that's a good example. So here are in red circles, the three genes that we find in our transcriptomes. And what we see is that only in Pseudodiploria clivosa, the thermally sensitive species, we see major changes in gene expression because the organism is already experiencing apoptosis. If we look at the photosymbionts again, there is many categories, but obviously the most relevant or interesting one to highlight here is photosynthesis. And the gene that uh, we see as showing lineage specific adaptation here is the um, ACPPC, which is an important protein in, in making the pigments in photosystem one and photosystem two. And what you see is that is a, more active in the Rivolium B5 lineage. So in summary, we, I think, have shown experimentally that metabolic complementarity is essential in developing an understanding of coral holobions, which is particularly important in the context of, of, of corally, uh, thermally induced bleaching. Different members of different holobions respond differently to heat stress. The IFR approach reveals responsive stimulus. And a good example is the symbiote zone pH balance. Then the IFR ESG approach reveals uh, master control genes that tend to be upstream of processes like photosystem repair. And the most important take home message is that the comparative framework is really essential to predict future outcomes of climate change. I would like to acknowledge my collaborators and grad students and the funding sources. Most of this work was funded by the National Science Foundation. Thank you. I'll be happy to take questions now.